Uh, welcome everybody to the, is it August already? Oh my gosh, where has summer gone? The August Cocktails and Fishtails tonight. Uh, we are so excited to have Dr. Chad here, um, jelly expert extraordinaire. So while you're getting settled in with whatever beverage you have for the evening, uh, we of course like to ask our presenters to share with us their favorite cocktail and a wild fish tail. So take it away, Chad. What do you got for us? Man, I don't know about favorite cocktail. I'm more of a, a cerveza drinker myself. Oh, I like absolutely acceptable. <laughs> I'm not that sophisticated. <laughs> um, but is there there's like the jellyfish brewing company? I'm like sure <laughs> something there strike your fancy. I haven't been up there yet, but one day I was gonna try and brew my own beer called like sea nettle stout and I a brewing kit and thing, and I it didn't turn out so good, but my buddies turned out really great. But no, I I I, I come up with better names than I do at making. <laughs> I feel like the labels have the battle. I buy beer definitely for good labels. So I'm here for the sea nettle stout when it becomes a thing. Yeah, it's going to be good. <laughs> you heard it here first, it. folks. <laughs> Let it be trademarked. We'll do uh, uh, lion's mane jelly red, um, you know, cyania orange. You know, we, we can do a bunch of different ones if we, you know, we could do a sampler pack. That's fantastic. <laughs> How about a wild fish tail for us? Um, well, Back a long time ago, I used to work with, these aren't fish. I used to work with giant squids, um, squids. Um, these squids get to be about five feet long, almost weigh a hundred pounds when they're really big. And many moons ago, I used to work at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. I worked there for 13 years and I was a research and development of course. So my job was to go out into the world, find new and different things, collect, figure out how to collect them, how to transport them back, how to put them on display, et cetera, et cetera. So part of that, I was working on humbled squids. And so I would travel around to wherever it was that the squids live. Now these, these are big and I'm not a big person, obviously myself. Um, so a guy like me catching squids using the Mexican technique hand line, that's a fair fight, you know? And then the guys on the boat would like to watch me do this stuff. Um, then, you know, at the time there were all these um, television programs called like Demonio Rojo and Diablo Rojo. Like they were, make, they were making the squids sound really scary. And about the, that time, the researchers I was with were decided it'd be a good idea to go night diving with these in the Sea of Cortez in Mexico. And so that's what we did. And we were doing blue, what's called blue water diving, but at nighttime, it's really black water diving. And that's when you can't see the bottom. So you use special techniques. It's a big long line and you got a safety diver and then the other divers who are out collecting at different levels. <clears throat> so in this particular dive, I was, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, safety diver and I'm, I'm, I'm looking down, I have a, a, a light on the end of a, a lead weight um, down at the bottom, that's keeping us all in place. And I'm using that light and weight to per, um, perfect my squid fishing technique. So I would watch the squids come in and grab the light and then I'd try and pull them up. Well, I, I learned that when I was fishing from the boat, I was pulling too soon. I have to wait till the squid gets it and hugs it and then give it a pull. Um, and then it's like uh -huh. two cinder blocks. Um, and so that's, a lot of that's not the, the, the weird part. You know, everybody was telling us how scary the squids were and stuff. You know, I'd see them come and look at me and stuff and I wasn't that worried about it. But this one particular time, <clears throat> I was feeling a little weird, <clears throat> excuse me. And I, I just kind of felt hinky and I, I turned around and I just looked behind me and there was this giant black ink cloud. So there was this big giant squid just looking at me. And then when I looked at him, he took off. And that spooked me a little bit. <laughs> that's, I, yeah, but that's the only one that's ever sort of spooked me. But the squids never bothered us. They never grabbed us. Nothing that the television shows told us would happen. And as it turns out at the end of the day, <clears throat> the person who was kind of perpetuating a lot of this stuff, wanted to start a new business where, you know how people go scuba diving and do cage diving with white sharks? He wanted to start a business where he would dive with giant squids. And so he was really kind of making them sound scary so that people would come and do that. But anyway, they're not that scary. But you, know, you got to be, you got to respect the squids. They're big. And they, you know, they've got a great big, huge beak. 
um, their suckers have like uh, chitinous uh, rings in them. That's kind of like fingernails. And they've got all these little hooks like teeth on them. So when they grab something with their suckers, those little hooks grab into it. And then they pull it to the mouth, which has this great big triangular beak. And um, then they just go to town. So yeah, you got to the squids, but it's <laughs> my best fish tail. That is that is a fantastic fish tail. Uh, well armed for like a whole a whole another uh, cocktails and fish tails presentation featuring squid. I think. Hmm. <laughs> um, well, for those of you who are tuning in, um, we are so excited to have you here, uh, so you can have your questions answered live at the end of Chad's presentation tonight. Um, so go ahead and type in the comments where you're watching from just to get to familiar with that comment feature on, on Facebook here. Um, and of course, type those comments in as you think of questions and we'll make sure those get answered at the end. Um, and I think we're in for just such a treat here. Um, Chad is a jellyfish expert with years and years and years, like, what is it, almost 20 years of experience in the jelly world. Um, and so uh, it's perfect timing because one of my top questions in my email box right now is, you know, oh no, there's all these jellies on the beach. Like, why are they here? Where did they come from? So uh, here to answer, why do we see jellies when we see them uh, is Chad. So I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, take it away. Okay. So let me see. I'll do the share screen thing. And then I want this. And then I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to go all the way. Okay. Beautiful. Everybody there? We're cool. golden. Okay. So we're going to talk about jellyfish husbandry. That's how you take care of jellyfish, not being married to them. <laughs> and then applied research and development that we do at Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium, which is where I am now. Um, recently, probably about three or four years ago, I got to help. Um, think up and help participate in building the new aquarium at Point Defiance Zoo Aquarium. And that part of that was building a new jellyfish gallery. So that's been a, a lot of fun. Um, so, so the plan for tonight is we're going to talk about first, why are jellyfish important? How do we keep the jellyfish gallery at PDZA sustainable? And how do I study jellyfish and climate variation to try and answer the question, why do we see jellyfish when we see jellyfish? And then some of the other research activities that the Jelly Lab at PDZA um, are currently involved in. It's not just all jellies all the time, but we, we like to branch out a little bit. So jellies are important in their ecosystems for a lot of different reasons. They're predators of zooplankton, and they're also, as such, since they eat zooplankton, they're also competitors. So anything else that wants to eat zooplankton is going to be competing with jellyfish if a lot of jellyfish are around. But they definitely have a role in their ecosystem. They have a job to do. They're also eaten by a lot of other things. They're food. So yeah, sea turtles eat them. Ocean sunfish eat them. Other kinds of fishes eat them. And there I'm showing uh, on the right-hand side, and there's a big yellow jellyfish. Everybody in Puget Sound maybe might recognize that one. That's the egg yolk jelly. That's Bacillophora kamchatka. That jellyfish is the top of the gelatinous zooplankton food chain. As such, it helps to regulate the abundance of troublesome others. So it's at the top of the food chain and it eats all of the other jellies. I put the moon jelly in there because that's another one we see here in the sound. Um, moons are eaten by egg yolk jellies and moons are kind of the bottom of the gelatinous zooplankton food chain. And then, so that's sort of what's happening there. They're also homes to a lot of different things. There are hitchhiking symbionts that use jellyfish for protection from predators. Um, so these little fishes, those are medusa fish. They live in and amongst the tentacles of jellies and somehow they're able to not get stung. It's vision, they see the tentacles and avoid them. And then there I've got a, an or a Northeast Pacific sea nettle and there's a little white dot on the underside of its belt. That's a crab. It's a hitchhiking crab. Crabs, as it turns out, a number of different species here in Puget Sound, um, when they're crab zoea or, or swimming, uh, when they're in their swimming larval stage, they're able to land on the top of a jellyfish and then metamorphose into a juvenile crab, and then they wander around on top of the jellyfish. And the purpose of this for the 
crab is that the jelly is going to transport that crab to someplace else. And eventually the crab, uh, as it gets bigger, jumps off of the jelly and lands on the bottom and then takes up uh, life, you know, on the bottom and in the mud. Also, crabs being what they are, they have a wide diet and they're pugilistic. They like to fight <laughs> and they like to eat whatever they're physically capable of eating. When parasites land on jellyfish bells and there are crabs on the jellyfish bell, the crabs go over and try to eat the, the parasites. So they'll either successfully eat the parasite or chase it away in what I call the, the bouncer effect. So if you're a jellyfish, it's good to have crabs. If you come to PDZA, you might see crabs on our jellyfish. Um, jellyfish are also possibly indicators. Well, actually they are indicators of ecosystems that are out of balance because their life cycles can be completed within one year so if you do something big in the ecosystem and you see a whole bunch of jellyfish next year, might those two things may be related. Also, humans uh, use jellyfish. People have been eating them over in Asia for over a thousand years. There's a, an active a commercial fishery for jellies. They take these things and they prepare them. They cut them up and they've got a whole process for preparing them. But, and when you eat them, it's kind of like a texture thing. It's like chewing on a rubber band a little bit that squishes through at the end. And then it mostly tastes sort of like whatever you flavor it as. But yeah, people eat jellyfish. And then marine mammals. For some reason, marine mammals play with jellyfish. This is an orca playing with a Northeast Pacific sea nettle in Monterey Bay. This happened last summer. Here in the Firth of Forth in Scotland, there's a dolphin booting a moon jelly around. Here in Puget Sound, here's a humpback whale wearing a lion's mane jelly for a hat or a nose. Well, that's not where their nose is. But anyway, why do they do this? I, I don't know. Nobody knows, <laughs> but they do it. Maybe it's just fun. <laughs> but jellies can also negatively affect industry, things that we people like to do. So yeah, of course, they sting swimmers at beaches. So if you happen to be like in Australia and get bit, you know, stung by one of the Irukandji syndrome causing jellies, that can be problematic. Uh, so that's, you know, negatively affects tourism. But also jellyfish, when they're really abundant, they can affect fish farms and they can also foul fishing nets. So if you've got a great big sand, open ocean Atlantic uh, salmon net pen over there in the Atlantic where it's appropriate to do that, um, and a big slug of jellyfish, a swarm of jellyfish come through, they can clog up all the holes in the net. They release a bunch of slime, they release a bunch of stingers, which then uh, hit the fish's eyes, skin, and gills, causes the fish to go off feed, can also suffocate them, and can kill them. And it takes two years to grow a little bitty salmon into one that's fit for sale. So if you've got a bunch of jellies coming through and kind of wiping things out, that's a problem. And when I was living over in Scotland, part of what I did was advise the Scottish government on their jellyfish and aquacultured salmon uh, issues. And I gave them some suggestions, which I won't tell you what they are now, but at the end of the talk, I could tell you what they are and they'd make total sense. But they said, oh, Chad, you have no idea how big these things are. And I said, I'm an American. This isn't big. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Um, and then also jellyfish can shut down nuclear power plants. Anything that sucks seawater in and sends seawater back out can get clogged with jellyfish. And a lot of nuclear power plants suck seawater in to cool the reactors, and then they send the seawater back out. If you have to shut down the seawater system because it's all fouled with jellyfish, the, the reactors start to warm up. That's a problem <laughs> for nuclear power plants. And this happens all around the world. It's, it's not limited to one part of the world. Actually, jellyfish uh, shut down one of our uh, aircraft carriers, an American aircraft carrier, while it was uh, docked down in Australia. They suck seawater in for their, to cool their nuclear reactors and shut the whole aircraft carrier down in the dock because they sucked in a bunch of jellies. They have ways to deal with that, but it's all secret. <laughs> so the goal of the Point Fine Zoo and Aquarium uh, Jellyfish Gallery is to exemplify the diversity of jellyfishes. Jellies come in a lot of different body forms. Um, we've kind of got a small jellies gallery. Um, but it's super flexible. We have five different displays and it's very flexible. So different style, different gel, jellyfish body forms do better in different styles or types 
of exhibit tanks or different shapes of tanks. And so I have uh, a collection of the exhibit shapes that will enable me to display any jellyfish that's known to exist that will fit into my tanks. Because down in the deep sea, there are some great big ones that are the size of a Volkswagen bus. I don't have any tanks that big. And over in the UK, they have ones that are the size of like a great big 55 gallon barrel. I don't have any tanks that big, but for smaller things, we can display anything we can get my hands on. And then also we've plumbed things in back so I can make the seawater whatever flavor I want. I can make it warm or cold, or I can change the saltiness of the water. We plumbed it to be as flexible as possible. Our signage is all digital. So if we get a new species in and we want to quickly write up a new little blurb about it, we can just change it like that. A lot of this is, um, I love being an aquarist because it's blending science and art. Um, we set up displays. Sometimes we're, we're trying to convey a scientific message and it's really more about that. And that's what the four main displays with the little monitors above them are. Or sometimes it's more about art. So down there in the bottom right-hand corner, that's the jelly globe. That's just about art. It's just meant to look cool. Uh, it's something for people to go and touch and they get wet when they touch it and they take their pictures with it. And, and this makes me happy when I see families stop and do stuff like this. Here's kind of, I've got a, a just an RGB light from Amazon uh, underneath it. And it just kind of cycles through all of these different colors, but that's the jelly globe. The jelly globe at the Point of Fine Zoo and Aquarium, I, I was traveling in Japan and I, I got the idea at the Enoshima Aquarium. I saw a different jelly globe there. It doesn't function like the one that we have. And I said to the aquarist there, I said, Aya, Aya Adashi was somebody I, somebody I know. We're building a new aquarium. Can I borrow your plans to put a globe into our space? And her managers wouldn't let her. And I felt bad about that. But I'm me, so I wasn't going to stop. <laughs> so I started doing the R&D on a globe. Um, and then I reached out to some industry colleagues that I have, an acrylic manufacturer and somebody from a design build company. And, and the three of us, we kind of, they said, well, Chad, we'll supply you the materials if you'll do the R&D. And so I said, sure, OK. So I did the R&D on this uh, uh, on a two-foot globe. And then I scaled it up to a three-foot globe. And um, this was the very first one in America, uh, and PDCA got this for free, gratis, just because you know I did I did the R and D work. I wrote some instructions, and now anyone who purchases one of these gets a set of instructions. And so this globe you can find all over the world now, which I'm I'm pleased about that because you know we should share this idea. <laughs> anyway, that's the art part. So how do where do we get our jellyfish? Um, well, there are a number of different places we could purchase them from a, a collector from some part of the world, but we only do that rarely. It's very expensive. And you know, there's no guarantee that on the day they go collecting, they're gonna find anything. Fishing is fishing. So we don't really rely on purchasing specimens unless we wanna get something really exotic from like China or Japan or something like that. Collecting from the wild is something that we do, um, or we can grow our own. I do a lot of this. I, when I first started at PDZA, we do mostly collecting from the wild, but we're transitioning over now to making a sustainable um, jellyfish aquaculture program where we grow all of our own jellies now. And this lowers the long-term costs and it's far more reliable than, oh, I'm gonna go out there fishing today. Oh, there's none out there today, rats. <laughs> so growing our own is very, um, is the way that we pr I prefer to do it. And then anything that we have extra, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, we, we have kind of a network and we trade things around. So I might send some jellies to Georgia and Georgia might send me something in trade. Um, and we do a lot of that. So jelly fishing, how do we do this? Well, this is what it looks like when SpongeBob's doing it. And this is what it looks like when my team's doing it. It doesn't look that different <laughs> to me. And it's a lot of fun. This is, this is us over in uh, Quartermaster Harbor looking for moon jellies. Um, and there we are. <laughs> and then we bring them back into the lab. We collect them, we put them into coolers. And once they're in the coolers, then we bring them into the lab and kind of acclimate them. And this is us just sort of going through that process. We also go down onto the floating docks. We collect there. And when we're down there, we do, a lot of people always ask us what we're doing. 
So we do a lot of public outreach, not on purpose, just because people ask us what we're doing and, and, we, and you know, we're excited about it. So we tell them what we're doing. And as it turns out, you can get the, any visitor or public or whoever it is down there in the dock, you can turn them into good field biologists. You just tell them what you're after and all of a sudden you've got 50 people looking for what you're after, you'll find it. It's awesome. This works in whatever part of the world you are at. Uh, <laughs> this used to work for me over in Scotland. Hey, Chad, mom, dad, there's a guy over here looking for jellyfish. And then they'd all come over and then they'd, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> we also, like I said, we grow our own jellyfish using in vitro fertilization. So this is a big uh, female lion's mane jelly washed up on the beach. And you can see she's got um, some orangish stuff in her oral arms all around the perimeter. There's dark orange and then lighter orange. All that lighter orange stuff, those are larval jellyfish. So he's got millions and millions of them there. So the way that jellyfish reproduction kind of works, I'll show you some pictures of this, but they're separate sexes. There's males and females. So when a jellyfish washes up on the beach, I'll collect the reproductive material that I need and I'll take that back to the lab and then I mix it together in vitro fertilization. In vitro just means in glass. Sometimes if I'm feeling saucy, I'll do it in plastic just because. <laughs> but so that's where we, we facilitate the growing of the jellies is we, we harvest the material we need from the field and then bring it in, start cultures and from there we grow our own jellies. Just gonna show you the life cycle of the jellyfish now. So if I had mom and dad moon jelly here and I mixed the sperm and eggs, I would get something called a planula larva here. And then a planula larva is about three millimeters long and one millimeter wide and it's covered in cilia. It's like a fuzzy ciliated tic-tac candy swimming around through the water and they kind of rotate around. And then they look for a place to settle and metamorphose, change shape into a polyp. The polyp looks like a little tiny baby sea anemone. They're, you know, like four millimeters tall, a big one's like eight millimeters tall, uh, maybe two or three millimeters wide. Polyp is a slang term. Really, it's called a siphistema, but we say polyp just because it's easier to say. <laughs> so these polyps asexually reproduce here in 1B. They asexually reproduce copies of themselves, and they do this in a number of different ways. But when environmental conditions are right, those polyps metamorphose and change shape again, and they go into jellyfish production mode. So here you can see a polyp or a siphistema that has metamorphosed into a strobola stage, or it's a polyp that's releasing baby jellyfish. Each, it, imagine uh, like a cup, a coffee cup with a stack of little plates on top of it. And each of those little plates would be a baby jellyfish that's gonna break off and swim away and looks like that. That's a baby jellyfish that has just broken off of that strobla. At this point, we call that an ephyra. Right in the middle there, you can see the mouth. These things have stingers. They can sense light and dark. They can sense up from down. Um, and then they grow a little bit more into a meta ephyra. And then they continue to grow into the, the adult. How hard is it to grow these things versus how long does it take to produce them? So down there on the x-axis, I've got grow out time until display. And the short would be like one to two months to produce these things. And long would be like six months to produce these things. And over there on the y-axis, the rearing difficulty, way down there at the bottom would be super easy. And then way up there at the top would be difficult. So moon jellies, super duper easy. So when you travel a lot of different zoos and aquariums, you find moon jellies because they're pretty easy to grow. Australian spotted lagoon jellies are a little bit harder than that. These are tropicals. And then egg yolk jellies, Facilophora camptotica, our friend from Puget Sound, is a little harder than that. Northeast Pacific sea nettles, that one that the orca was tossing around or chewing on, those are a little harder. And something like a purple striped jelly would take even longer still. So we also grow our own jellyfish foods. So these are brine shrimp, or Timia noplii. Uh, so, you know, jellyfish, as we talked about earlier, they eat plankton. Well, you can't always harvest the plankton that you want. And going down and doing a plankton tow every single day to get enough of the plankton that you need to feed the gallery 
can be problematic. Plus, plankton's made up of all kinds of different larval invertebrate forms. And so those things would be settling out and metamorphosing into barnacles and crabs and tunicates all over your exhibits, which is not what you want. So we get brine shrimp eggs and then hatch these out. And here in C, letter C, you can kind of get an idea for how, what they kind of look like um, magnified. Um, and our Timinopleus is maybe two millimeters long, one millimeter wide. And those are kind of big, small foods. Sometimes I, I also have a lot of things that have even smaller mouths, so they need even smaller foods, and that's rotifers. So in B, you can see these little things. There's one by the black line there, the scale bar, that, that's a rotifer. These things, you can sustainably harvest these things. This is where I learned about what, this, what sustainability means to me. If I've got a carboy full of rotifers, these things reproduce within 24 hours. If I harvest this much today and then refill it back up and feed it, tomorrow I can harvest that much again. But if I harvest this much, it's too much and the, the culture will crash. So that's where I learned about sustainability. So rotifers are just lots of fun. So brand new people, I put them on live food harvesting and then they learn a whole suite of skills that help them as they advance in their careers. Jellyfish medusae don't live very long. They're ephemeral. They're a little bit like a cut flower or a mushroom. So the, the dominant and long-lived form really are the polyps. The polyps live for years and years and years, but the jellyfish medusae, they're generated simply to, to grow up, to reproduce, and start new colonies in different places. So they're not designed to live forever. You know, maybe a year, maybe two is how long a Medusa lives. So as a jelly keeper who's trying to keep exhibits full, I know that the jellies in that exhibit right now are only going to last this long. So when they fade, I'm going to have to plan for what's going to replace them coming back up. So you need to always be planning. It's a lot like playing chess. You're always playing, you know, thinking three or four moves ahead. Um, this is just kind of a little cartoon of a jellyfish water table. Um, ignore the stuff on the bottom, but up on the top, you can see that there are different sizes of tanks. So basically, baby jellies live in the smaller tanks. As they grow, they move up to the next size tank. As they grow bigger, they move on up to the next size tank. So it's a chain of production. So you're always trying to balance, okay, if I've got five different species in all these different life history stages, and I need to be able to have these on display at this time and they need to be, these ones need to be ready on that time. You see what I mean? It's a big slide puzzle. It's lots of fun. That's why I'm still doing it. It keeps me interested. <laughs> that, and I like to use data science um, to help me optimize growth. I do a lot of um, optimizing growth experiments, applied research to help me do my job better. Um, just for example, one of them I found is increasing temperature or increases Medusa growth within physiological tolerances. You go too hot, they flop out like an umbrella in a windstorm. Too cold, they shrink and get really um, smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, if it's too cold, you can increase the temperature and they'll start growing again. But if you went too hot, they come back down to too cold, and it's too late. It's not happening. <laughs> um, moderate stocking density is better than overstocking. You know, so 100 jellies in a tank will grow slower than 10 jellies in a tank. It's the same with cattle <laughs> and other things. Don't get married to one particular food item. Diversity is key. And multiple feeds per day is better than just one big massive feed. So, you know, if you eat stuff, it's going to take a while to digest what you've just eaten. And now you're ready to eat again. But if you give them all their food for the whole day, just at once, um, it's not that effective. Now, these are experiments I did probably about 15 years ago. So, yeah, <laughs> and, I'm, and since then I've sort of moved on a little bit, but all of these have held true and, and they inform what we, our decision making today. Okay, let's talk about jellyfish bloom ecology. Why do we see jellyfish when we see jellyfish? Well, here's just another moon jelly life cycle again, but so jellyfish abundances can be affected by natural things like climate, but also human linked factors can affect how many jellyfish we see. And there are a lot of them. I'm not gonna go through all of them. I'm just gonna go through, through a few of them that I thought were really kind of relevant to you know, where we are here in the South Sound. So firstly, let's talk about climate, climate variability. Um, 
So the seawater temperature changes normally on an annual cycle. Um, this uh, temperature chart that I'm showing you, this is stuff for the UK. This is from back when I was over there. But um, you can kind of see that in the winter time, you can kind of expect it to be the water to be colder. And in the summertime, you can kind of expect it to be warmer. And, and, and it, you know, it follows a nice little curve there. The same thing happens in Puget Sound. It's just that the absolute temperatures are a bit different. Some years are warmer than others. Some years you have a, a cold, a long, cold, dry winter. And some years you have a, a short, warm, wet winter. Think about the fruit trees in your backyard, maybe. Um, some years you get a lot of pears and some years there aren't any pears on the tree. That's what's going on in my backyard right now. So where does some of this climate variability take place? Well, in the case of the UK, it's the North Atlantic oscillation pattern. So some years you'll get a warm, wet, short winter, and some years you'll get a long, cold, dry winter. And that affects what the seawater parameters are like, which affects whether or not polyps will make more polyps or whether polyps will decide to, it's time to start making jellyfish. Decadal. Oh, over here where we live, you know, it's like, it's the um, El Nino and La Nina are things that happen, you know, every five years, every 10 years, but those things affect the sea surface temperature. And then over hundred plus years, well, climate change is something that folks are worried about. It's different than just climate variability, climate change. So over the next hundred years, sea surface temperatures are projected to increase by one or two degrees Celsius, depending on where you are. <laughs> and that has, may have broad, broad reaching implications, not only for jellyfish, but lots of other things too. I'm not even getting into ocean acidification yet. Maybe someday. One of the things that people do to affect jellyfish abundance is something called eutrophication. So basically, if you dump a bunch of fertilizer into the water, there are a lot of phytoplankton, plant plankton that live in the water. Well, plants on land really like fertilizer. It helps them grow. It also helps phytoplankton grow. So if you put a lot of fertilizer or a lot of nutrients into the water, the water can turn green. Um, so nit nitrogen and phosphorus are some of the, the nutrients that get put in there. And what this means for jellyfish, this is a great big, they call this a dustbin jelly, Rhizostoma octopus over in the UK. What this means for jellies is that the visibility in the water is lower. Really, it's more important for the fishes, I think, because if a fish is a visual predator and it needs to go out and see that piece of plankton in order to eat it or shrimp or whatever it is to go and eat it, but it can't see it because the water's all green, well, that's a problem for fish. But jellyfish don't use eyes to find food. They just go rowing through the water, doing their thing, making their vortices, stinging things with their tentacles, retracting the tentacles, bringing the food to their mouths and eating it. Doesn't matter if the water's clear or not. The, but you know, and, and, and this also means there's, remember we said that jellyfish were competitors uh, with commercially important things for food. Well, it, that means there's more food for medusa and more food for polyps and more food means more growth and you can get bigger jellies. So eutrophication can have some pretty good implications. And you know, the fish, they either hang out and go hungry or they, or they leave in a eutrophied area. Where would I see a lot of eutrophication? Oh, maybe next to a place where there's a lot of agriculture, next to a city where there's a lot of wastewater runoff, stormwater runoff, things like that. You can expect to see eutrophication. Golf courses. <laughs> um, here's an example uh, of a different kind of thing. The eutrophication plays a role in this one, but habitat modification is another thing. Jellyfish polyps are looking for a place to live. And when humans come along and build things and stick them in the water, we give the jellyfish polyps another place to live. And they really like living on the undersides of floating things. And the reason for that is a, a jellyfish polyp, uh, it, it's sort of arranged in a cylinder with a ring of tentacles and a mouth. If it's sitting oriented like this, food that it eats and digests well, here's the thing about jellyfish polyps. They don't have a complete gut. So the mouth is also the anus. So the food that they, they eat, digest, then just comes right back out and then lands right next to the base of the polyp. And then that uh, becomes a, uh, an area where 
fouling organisms take root and then that can kill the polyp. So polyps instead have evolved or adapted or something to settle and metamorphose on the undersides of things. That way their tentacles dangle down. If they eat things and ingest them, it falls away and their tentacles can dangle down and they can fish really quite effectively that way. So the undersides of floating things are really popular for jellyfish polyps. So in Tapong Bay, Taiwan, they had this shallow, it's still there, <laughs> shallow semi-enclosed bay. And there's a lot of eutrophication there due to really poor circulation. There's only one entrance to this thing. Um, lots of farming around there. Uh, and they use, there are a lot of uh, rafts and net pens and things like that so that they can do fish pens and then oyster culture. Boy, look at all that floating or dangling jellyfish polyp for things to live on. That's wonderful. And it turned out to be excellent habitat for moon jelly polyps. And so here's what Tapong Bay, Taiwan looks like. And all those little hash marks in the middle, those are all the floating rafts. And you can see all the agriculture all around there. And you can see that there's really not much water going in or out of this bay. It caused a big problem for them. They were just all clogged up with jellyfish and having lots and lots of problems. And so they decided, let's remove the rafts. And that improved circulation, water quality, temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen. Here's a chart. So from 1999 to 2000, 2003, you can kind of get an idea of the abundance of moon jellies before they removed the rafts. And then they removed the rafts in 2022. And then bam, 20, 20, 2003, they're all gone. All the moon jellies are gone. So they just removed the habitat. That's all they did. Hmm. <laughs> so, so what would I, you know, in, in Puget Sound, where would I find floating structures? Uh, you know, all the floating docks over in Quartermaster Harbor, uh, here on Vashon, where I live. Yeah, all the mussels are loaded up with moon jelly polyps. I see them there. Um, and probably all the other floating docks around <laughs> as well. Where do je jellyfish polyps live naturally? You know, when you see those great big gooey duck clamshells and they're kind of half open, you know, on the bottom, oh boy, that's a nice little concave surface where they can settle and metamorphose and dangle down. They want to live on shells. Uh, and that's where we find them all around the world. The more and more we look, the more and more we find polyps on shells. Okay, how do I study the effects of climate variability on Medusa abundance? Well, I do this by measuring the effects of different environmental variables on different life history stages of jellies. And I look at effects of temperature and salinity and uh, pH on uh, planula and on the polyps and their different act asexual reproductive activities, and then also on growth of the developing jellyfish. And I do this for all the different species that I work with. So let's take a closer look at how moon jelly polyps, in this case, do uh, asexual reproduction while they're living on the bottom. One way they can do it is by budding new daughter polyps from the base of their uh, calyx of their body. So that's a daughter polyp budding off of a female moon jelly or a, a, a moon jelly polyp. Another thing they do is they make these things called podocysts, foot cysts. It looks like a little rollo candy, maybe two millimeters wide. A diameter, yeah. Um, so this little roll of candy is kind of covered in chitin, like fingernail-like material. And then there's living jellyfish material inside this little packet or capsule. And so the reason these exist is there are predators of jellyfish polyps, nudibranchs being one of them. So when a marine snail or slug comes along and eats up all the polyps, these podocysts remain. And then when the coast is clear, the polyps emerge and the colony goes back to doing what it was doing. Another way that polyps asexually reproduce is by undergoing that metamorphosis and um, becoming a strobola and then making a stack of baby jellyfish. And so I'm interested in the factors that are associated with these activities. So I'm gonna show you the results of just one experiment where just polyps for just some moon jellies. I'm not gonna, we could go on and on and on, but I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> um, so we're looking at the polyp stage for moon jellies. 
and I tested, in this case, five different temperatures with three different salinities, and I suspected there might be an interaction. Statistically, what's an interaction? Well, one uh, factor acting by itself might give you this result. Another factor acting by itself might give you this result, but when two factors are acting together, they give you a different result. So some people take drugs and they do okay, and they take alcohol and they do okay, but if they mix drugs and alcohol, they die. That's an interaction. I was looking, I like to, uh, <laughs> I was looking for 80% power to detect big effects. I look for large effect sizes. And what that means is I I'm not really interested in subtleties. I want to, I want to see a big result. And so I design my experiments so that I can see a big result, a meaningful result. Because remember, I'm doing applied science. I'm going to use this in the lab. Subtleties sometimes don't help me that much to accomplish my mission. These are just some of the incubators that I use. Um, yeah, they're cute. <laughs> um, these are ones that I used over in the UK, but I also I have now I have incubators at Point Defiance. And if you ever want to come see them, come see my incubators. They're lovely. <laughs> so let's look at the effects of temperature and salinity just on Dr. Paula production of moon gels. What happens? Okay, there's the results. So I ran this experiment for 12 weeks. Because I wanted, you know, and how long is a, a winter? How long is a summer? Eh, probably three months, 12 weeks. There on the x-axis, you see uh, temperatures. And there on the y-axis, you see the mean number of daughter polyps produced uh, in each of these different con conditions. And I tested the three different salinities, or how salty is the water, PSU 21, 27, or 34. 34 is what you'd find out there in the open ocean. 27 is kind of what you'd find here in Puget Sound. Our salinity fluctuates, you know, 27 to 31, at least out front of PDZA, that's what we get. So what did I find here? Well, as temperature increased, more daughter polyps were produced and salinity also had an effect. Um, so lower salinities caused more reproduction of daughter polyps of moon jelly polyps. Okay. What am I meant to draw from that? Well, it seems like lower salinity might be optimal for moon jelly polyps. Maybe if I was going to go looking for them, I might go looking around in an estuary under some shells or a floating dock. Oh, look, there they are. <laughs> and then there on the bottom, I just have a, an example of what the statistical model would look like in words that describes what, was, what the significant factors were. So yeah, temperature and salinity were significant in this one. So basically, the takeaway message is, Increased temperature made more daughter polyps from moon jellies. Let's look at the effect of temperature and salinity on photocyst production. Remember the little Rolo candies? And if a nudip prank comes along and eats the polyps, then when the coast is clear, the remember that? <laughs> it's kind of the same story. As temperature increases, more of these things are produced. Salinity was not uh, an effect uh, in this case. It takes longer to produce a photocyst than it does a daughter polyp because you got to make all that fingernail chitinish material, and it just takes longer to make these things. And so that's why you see, you know, you're only making like one or two of these in a 12-week period. Whereas if we go back, uh, daughter polyps, man, you can make like nine of these in a 12-week period, which is pretty, that's a lot. So let's look at the effects of temperature and salinity on strobilation. Now, look, the thing I also want to point out is we made more polyps when it was warm. We made more potosis when it was warm. Let's go get temperature and salinity on strobilation. When do we make more jellyfish? Oh, when it's cold. We don't make jellyfish when it's warm. <laughs> it's only when it's cold. And there seemed to be a salinity effect there at 9C. At, what's 9C? That's like um, 48 degrees Fahrenheit. OK. <laughs> so how about what are the effects of temperature and salinity on how many jellyfish each of those strobily produced? Well, not really much of an effect, but temperature salinity and the temperature salinity interaction were all significant. Okay, but still for me, the takeaway is cold. Colder is better if you wanna make more jellyfish. If you're gonna strobilate, it's gotta be cold. Why is that? Well, as it turns out, the molecular machinery that uh, causes polyps to strobilate is initiated 
by cold temperatures. It has to be cold enough for long enough for polyps to strobilate. When it's cold, these metabolites start getting produced inside the jellyfish polyp. And when enough of these metabolites have amassed, it triggers the metamorphosis. But if enough of them have not amassed, the metamorphosis does not occur and jellyfish are not produced. They just go back to making more daughter polyps and making more protocysts. Cool. So what do I think any of this means? Now I'm gonna, I'm showing you kind of a hypothetical model of when we see jellyfish uh, in relation to different seasons. So down there in the bottom, I got the seasons: spring, winter, summer, autumn. And then up there at the top, I've just got the temperatures that you would normally encounter during those seasons. And so where do we start? Well, I think if it's been cold enough for long enough in the winter time, that's when you sort of see strobilation and ephyra release. This makes sense. You wanna release your ephyra at the beginning of springtime. When the days are getting longer, there's more daylight, which means more energy for phytoplankton, which means more food for zooplankton, which means more food for developing baby jellyfish, because they've got to go from this big to this big by the end of the summer so that they can reproduce and start a whole new colony. So we release our ephyra in the early spring. Oh, and there's the ephyra growing. The polyps, strobilation ends then now as the water's warming up. We start making more daughter polyps and we start making photosis. The ephyra, meanwhile, are just getting bigger. They're out there growing, eating, 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 growing, 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 reproducing and releasing planula in the, in the summer and beginning of autumn time. Uh, as the sea surface temperature begins to decrease, budding and photosis production kind of slows down. And meanwhile, the, the larval forms, the planula that the medusae uh, have released, they're all swimming around for seven to 10 to 14 days, depending on things. And they're looking for a place to settle and metamorphose and develop into a polyp. The sophistomy, if it gets cold enough, start preparing to strobilate. Those little metabolites are beginning to build up in their little bodies. And if the minimum strobilation temperature threshold has been met, then they will strobilate and release ephyra. <laughs> so that was for moon jellies uh, in the UK. I'm starting to do all of these same studies now in Puget Sound. And I have results and I'm analyzing and interpreting the results now. Um, and just tell you kind of what the general findings are. Basically, for temperate jellyfish species, it's kind of the same story. And it doesn't really matter what part of the planet you're on <laughs> or around, what chunk of water you're by. For temperate cold water jellyfish, the, the trend seems to be when it's, uh, well, let's look at lion's mane jellies. Uh, the fishermen down at the dock at Point Defiance, they call these the big red ones. <laughs> and so at 20 degrees C, uh, all the lion's mane jelly polyps die. It's too warm for them at 20 degrees C. But at 15 degrees C, which is pretty warm, they're making lots and lots of daughter polyps. Really what they're making are potasis, which metamorphose into daughter polyps. And then they only strobilate down at 5 C. Let's look at our friend, the egg yolk jelly, Fasolophora, Fasolophora Kamchatka. These are pretty common in Puget Sound, some years more common than others. At 20 C, all the egg yolk jelly polyps die. More polyps are formed at 15 C, and egg yolk jellies strobilate from 5 to 15 C. That's different. If we go, I'm just going to compare and contrast egg yolk jellies and lion's mane jellies in Puget Sound and, and just see if this rings true with your experience on this chunk of water. It seems like some years there are lion's mane jellies and some years there just aren't. And it seems like every year we have egg yolk jellies. Now some years we have a whole bunch of egg yolk jellies and some years there are fewer egg yolk jellies. But every year we have egg yolk jellies. And some years we have lion's mane jellies and some years we don't. I'm proposing so far, I think, that we only see lion's mane jellies when we've had a good cold long winter previously. We see more lion's jellies this summer based on what last winter was like. However, egg yolk jellies, they strobilate at a bunch of different temperatures. They're not waiting for it to get cold enough for long enough. They've got other factors that are driving whether or not they strobilate. And I don't know what they are yet. 
I have to keep banging my head on that. But I think that's why we see more egg yolk jellies in Puget Sound and fewer lion's mane jellies. And I think lion's mane jellies are kind of episodic. Moon jellies, well, we've made a lot of great habitat for them and they're able to reproduce, especially in the, the shallows of, of the South Sound. Over here at Quartermaster Harbor, it's a great habitat for moon jellies. Um, it's really fun for me because I like looking at them. <laughs> if we go out to the open ocean on our coast, the uh, Northeast Pacific sea nettle, Chrysorophysessens, at 20, they, these guys range a little bit farther south than, than, than where we are. So at 20 C, they produce many daughter polyps, but they only strobe late from five to 10 C. It's the same trend. In the warmer water, they make more daughter polyps. In the colder water, they need strobe late. What does any of this mean? Well, a lot, <laughs> but I don't know, search your memory. There seems to be this general sort of feeling that in the, in the media, at least, that in the face of climate change, it's gonna be a slime filled ocean. Jellies are gonna take over the world. Jellies are just gonna jelly, 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 jelly. But if the sea surface temperature is gradually increasing over time and it's just warming, 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 and temperate jellyfish have to be cold enough for long enough in order to strobilate, if the water continues to warm, they can't strobilate. How can it possibly be a slime filled ocean? They, they're not being generated. What is it? Huh. <laughs> so I think though, what this ultimately the effects of climate change for jellies, temperate jellies, is that ranges are changing. So they're starting to gradually shift northward. Um, and when blooms do form, they might actually be larger than what people have traditionally used to seeing. Because imagine this scenario. We're kind of on the edge, the southern edge of this one particular species. Well, actually we are in Puget Sound. We're at the southern edge of the lion's mane jelly range. Imagine your polyps have just been sitting there. You haven't been strobilating because you've just, it's been warm. And so you're making more polyps and more polyps and more polyps and more polyps and more polyps. Okay, here comes El Nino or La Nina and it makes the cold, the water really cold for a long enough time. And now all the polyps in that colony strobilate. And all the people up there go, whoa, where did all these come from? They're gonna take over the world. And, and then, you know, it gets a lot of media attention. People, um, and they, they like to get under the media and say, look, there's this, uh, all our nets are clogged up with jellies and, and, and people are very excited when they see a lot of jellies. Nobody reports when the jellies have gone missing. We used to see them here all the time and now they're just gone and we never see them anymore. Nobody reports that, but it's happening. So I think that ranges are changing or local populations may or may be able to adapt in time, evolve in time to be able to, at a rate concurrent with the changes that are happening, that might be happening. I don't know. That's stuff for me to chew on. Yeah. So who knows? We might eventually see fewer and fewer lines, man jellies and Puget Sound. I'd be really sad about that because these are one of my favorites. They're just big, beautiful beasts. This is the nastiest stinger we have in the sound, um, but they're just glorious, um, really. You know, they only get to be about th uh, this big in the sound, but up at the farther north you go, they just keep getting bigger, <laughs> all the way up to six feet across. Uh, <laughs> okay, this is going to be the, almost next to the last slide. Um, we're leaving jellyfish now. And this is something that I'm very excited about. We are just now starting to uh, a long-term collaboration with the Department of Natural Resources. And we're working on bull kelp bed restoration and eelgrass bed restoration in Puget Sound. And we're curious about the effects of climate change. Now, these things are really important habitats. Um, you know, the, the bull kelp is kind of like the rainforest of Puget Sound. And then the eelgrass are kind of like the Great Barrier Reefs. They, they, they form habitat, lots of things live there. These places are just so important and they're declining in numbers. And Department of Natural Resources and also Puget Sound Restoration Fund and some others are interested in trying to get these things reestablished. And actually tomorrow morning, I'll be meeting with uh, two of the DNR uh, researchers. Um, we've got some uh, cold water lab space carved out in our cold water quarantine area and they'll be doing controlled experiments on seagrass uh, fluoration, um, getting them to make seeds. And then also we'll be uh, growing uh, bull kelp spores on various substrates and then hoping to outplant those someday and, you know, make the sound a little bit better place, you know, and well, why is any of this important? 
well, so folks like my little one here, you know, can enjoy, you know, eelgrass beds and gooey ducks and moon jellies and all that stuff. That's why I think it's important. Um, you know, there are lots of other reasons, but this is my selfish reason. <laughs> so in summary, we talked a little bit about how we keep the jellyfish gallery at Point Fine Zoo and Aquarium sustainable. I introduced the way that we study effects of climate variability on jellies. And we noted that increasing sea surface temperature might not be a benefit to temperate jellyfish because it might inhibit stribulation. And then described an exciting new collaboration with the Department of Natural Resources. Now, if these, are, if these um, bull kelp photos belong to you, I grabbed these off of Google image search. So please forgive me if I did that. I just meant to use them as um, educational. <laughs> so anyway, they're beautiful. I didn't have photos of my own. So with that being said, thank you very much for having me. And that's all I have. And this is the point where the crowd goes wild. <laughs> We had a lot of people tuning in. Uh, oh, cool. Some from Anchorage, Alaska. Lots of big oh, harbor. Right I'm guessing there's a Georgia oh. connection in the in the audience because somebody's wondering how do you mail a jellyfish to Georgia? Uh, but yeah, lots of lots of good stuff going on. So for those of you tuning in, um, get those questions in the comments so we can have uh, Chad answer those for you. Um, but yeah, but we can you. start with uh, Anna's question of their family's interested in, yeah, how do you mail a jellyfish? How do you mail them? Yeah. FedEx. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, truly. So, uh, of course, you got to make sure all your permits and everything are in, in you know, proper order, but we'll assume that all that's squared away. Uh, I collect a jelly. I, I bag Have you ever been to the fish store and you get those little fish bags? It's... Uh -huh that a plastic bag I'll get the jellyfish into the plastic bag and then I squeeze out all of the air you don't want to have any air bubbles in the shipping bag you squeeze all of that out and you twist it and then tighten it up and then I double bag it and then I put that into a, a cardboard box that's got a styrofoam cooler in it and that's got a bag lined in it which is double bagged because airlines really don't like seawater drifting around in their airplanes while they're flying turns out <laughs> so, and jellies don't do so well when all the water leaks out of their bag. So I double and quadruple bag things. Um, so I got into one bag, no air, double bag into the cooler box. And then depending on the temperature, are these tropical jellies or are they cold water jellies? If they're cold water jellies, then I put in a few ice packs with that, bag it all up, pack it up nice, weigh it, and contact FedEx and say, hey, I got a, a pickup tomorrow. It's going to be about 45 pounds, and um, please charge these other people. They're going to pay for it, not me. <laughs> and, and that's how we do it. That's yeah. fantastic. Overnight. <laughs> Overnight. Perfect. Um, so there you have it, Anna. Although Anna was, oh, is clarifying that since you send them to the Georgia Zoo. Um, oh, Georgia Aquarium? Yep, yeah, that makes more sense. <laughs> yeah. Great question, Anna. I, I'm also we seeing... all around the world. All around the world. <laughs> All around the world. Amazing. Uh, Jack is mentioning that they've seen your jelly presentations at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, it sounds like, and they're amazing. So it was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. You've got some fans in the audience. <laughs> um, all right. Another question coming in. Uh, we have someone who swims at Owen Beach year round, and this year he and other swimmers have noticed a lot less lion's mane than years before, and even feel the ones they have seen, or wait, yeah, and sorry, reading is hard. Um, they feel the ones that they've seen have um, all been huge. Does this align with your data collection for the year? It's, it seems like it, yeah. It, there have been few produced but they're huge. They're huge, yeah. And, Interesting. And, and that's what I've been seeing around, but it's, it, they're not, haven't been a lot of them. Um, last year was a banner year for lion's mane jellies. And, and I'm still kind of collecting and percolating. So another thing that I do is I collect the sea surface temperature data from the NOAA buoys from okay. here, there, and around. And then I kind of look at what happened. And you know, that's how I know if last year was a cold year or a warm year, is I, the NOAA buoys is how I do it. Yeah, we definitely noticed, I mean, with the blob and all, like the, we kind of had the, the, we'll call like a ocean heat wave um, 
and noticed like oyster reproduction skyrocketed in a lot of those like warmer bays. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised. Well, I mean, it's all important. Yeah. Um, so speaking of jellies on the beach, uh, if you find a stranded jelly washed up during the low tide, can you save it? And if you can't save it, what eats the dead jelly? Um, well, it depends on how far gone it is. It's possible to save them. Um, but if they've been up there for a little while, they're probably doomed. But it's not a terrible thing. Remember, they're like cut flowers. It's the polyp that's, that's living for a long time. And they're, they're, they're meant to be plankton, which most plankton doesn't make it. <laughs> but, you know, if they wash up, that's OK, because they're going to land on the beach and all kinds of amphipods and all the other pods, copepods, ice pods, amphipods, mainly amphipods, the beach hoppers, are going to feast on those guys. So, I mean, amphipods have to eat too. Yeah, I would say, yeah, the potato chips of the sea need to have energy too. I agree. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, yeah, more, more observations coming in on the comments of sadly seeing lots of large lines being washed up on the shore. Thanks. Renate for that, uh, I think that a very large one seen at Sunnyside Beach. So um, a range there. It's um, sad that they washed up because, you know, they look so much better when they're all out and stretched out. Those tentacles on one this big can easily stretch, I don't know, 75 yards or meters. Wow. They just stretch way out. So if you're swimming along, um, and you're getting stung, but you don't see the Medusa anywhere, you might have swam through the tentacle trail. Totally. As a scuba diver, this very sensitive little spot <laughs> that is the only thing showing on your whole entire body is yeah. not a fantastic place to just, yeah, you're like, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I know that one. I know that. Here's, here's another bad one. You're, you're working with jellies and you got a cleaning tool or something like a brush and you've got tentacles on the brush. And so you march over to the sink to rinse the brush and you start doing the bristle brush like this. A little piece of it flings into your eye. Oh, Chad, no. <laughs> you only do that once. <laughs> Safety goggles for the rest of your life in the cleaning factory, it sounds Never like. That ever again. <laughs> but yeah, I've been hit right here. And, and that's okay. a, just, but you know, you're scuba diving, so you just got to suck it up. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of yeah. stinging, Rachel has a great question. Um, I'm going to liken it to like, like a flavor profile of sting. So being that you work with jellies a lot, we imagine that you've been stung by a few. Uh, and she's wondering if like different jellies have like a different variation of sting, whether it's like more itchy or more burny or like hot sensations, like. Oh, well, I like your style. That's a great question. That's a fabulous Fantastic. question. <laughs> yeah. But when, yes, they're different. Great. <laughs> and uh, when I was, a newer jelly keeper, I was very cavalier. And I used to sample jellyfish stings like a person would sample fine wines. What, like a sommelier of- oh, Yeah, I'm a sommelier of jellyfish stings. <laughs> I've just sampled a lot of them. Because, you know, you get stung and, and then it, okay, that's a little bit mildly irritating. It's annoying. Hey, wait, it's, it's starting to get worse. It, 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 wait, this is starting to ramp up. Like, what? how bad is this going to get? And then people's anxiety levels start to go, and I was working with so many lab mates and stuff. I just needed to be able to assuage fears like, hey, man, it's, it's going to be fine. We're going to treat you, which maybe I'll talk about that if you want. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that would be a great follow up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they all definitely have difference, um, difference in stings. And it has to do with how, what kind of stinging cells they have. The stinging cells are called C-N-I-D-A-E. And that's where animals that belong to that group get there. That's animals that belong to the phylum Cnidaria is from Nidae. So, you know, anything, all the Cnidarians have Nidae. There are lots of different kinds of Nidae. One kind is a nematocyst, which is designed for stinging and injecting poison, neurotoxins, into a prey to inactivate it so that they can eat it. Because if you're a soft-bodied gelatinous animal and you want to eat something like a shrimp, you want it to not wiggle while you're trying to eat it because it could thrash your body apart. 
or if a fish could do that to you as well. So you want to sting it, put it to sleep, and then eat it. So they have neurotoxins. So one, what kind of neurotoxins do they have? What is this jellyfish designed to eat? And how big and nasty are their particular nematocysts? Are they little tiny ones with no barbs? And, and to get into the taxonomy of that, I mean, they, there is a taxonomy of nematocysts. And, and I would imagine like thinking of like the box jelly as- Oh well, yeah, and so that, you know, a box jelly would be a great big hollow tube with um, spirally spikes. Ooh. And at the bottom, there are these great big fluted hook things. And so Literally. into you, and it's like a cactus needle it goes in. And then when you try and pull it out, it launches. Meanwhile, the capsule's back here pumping neurotoxin into you. Um, and so it can be cumulative. So you could get hit by a few really potent ones or a whole bunch of not so potent ones and eventually have an effect. Some, so something like a, a big Portuguese man of war is designed to bring down a fish or a krill. And to bring down a krill or a shrimp, you got to poke a hole through the shell. That's a big, powerful dart. But something like a moon jelly, they're eating like invertebrate eggs. They don't fight much. So you need a really weak nematocyst. So when you touch moon jellies, meh. I knew this guy, um, maybe this is too long, but um, there was a, a security guy back in Monterey and, and who, Jack. Uh, if you remember Jeffrey, <laughs> nice. great big mountain of a man, and he'd see me coming in on the boat, and uh, and he with buckets of jellyfish, and so we worked out a treatment plan for Jeffrey. He got to sample the different jellies, and so I started him off really mild, you know, moon jellies. Oh yeah, that's no problem at all. And then uh, you know worked his way up to like orange lion's mane jelly. Ooh, yeah, that that that. It's got a zap to it. Purple striped jelly. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now we're kind of getting somewhere. Then one day, he was like, Oh, I got it. No problem. I got this. I um I went out and got a siphonophore, which is called Preya. And they get to be as long as a football field. And um it's a siphonophore, uh, relative of the Portuguese man of war. And boy, when they sting, wowzers. So I got Jeffrey all lined up, got his arm under there, and, and they don't they decide when they sting. So just touching them, they don't do it. You got to kind of agitate them a little bit. And then the fire. So agitated him a little bit, and then bam, it hit Jeffrey. Now, this giant mountain of a man, his reaction to this was to jump up and start running. And he just <laughs> ran away. And I was like, Jeffrey, where'd you go? <laughs> the fight or flight, the flight response is strong in this man. So we treated him. So what's treatment look like? You remove the stinging. If you can see the tentacles on your arm, use something like a credit card, a piece of plastic, something like that, and scrape that off, rub it off, and then you rinse that off with some seawater if you have it, and then put vinegar on there. Um, if you're out camping, you've got mustard that's got vinegar in it. Put the vinegar on there, and then rinse that off with some more seawater. And then after that, I put on a topical antihistamine cream. Uh, I like Benadryl myself. I used to have to do a lot of television back at MBA. Um, now I don't have to. And so they'd make you say topical antihistamine cream. Benadryl is what you want. Like, yeah, camp product and, place or something. Yeah, and you'll hear people talk about like, oh, pee on it and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I mean, if you just want a practical joke, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you have it. <laughs> comedy, yeah, go for it. But no, it doesn't help at all. Actually, it can make it worse because there's re it in there. Yeah. Is there the putting the seawater specifically? Is that so it's like less react like fresh water? I'm imagining would like stress Thank the jelly out. That's so right. It's right. osmotic stress and it makes them fire. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, fantastic. So you heard it here, folks. Don't pee on your friends. Not not unless you know. <laughs> unless you yeah can. <laughs> we won't judge you. You do whatever uh, you want, but mustard might be better. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Carly has the vinegar every time. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Uh, Carly has a great question, and I always know these are hard for me because I have a trouble with my sea creature hierarchies. I love them all, but do you have a favorite jellyfish? Not, not really. Um, they're they're all cool for different reasons. 
Do you have a favorite jellyfish sting? Oh, oh wait. <laughs> which which wave do you want to ride? <laughs> I, I, I truly do love lion's mane jellies. Uh, okay. This time we have the orange lion's mane jelly, Cyanea capillata, but there's another one that lives um, over in the UK called Cyanea lamarckii, and it's blue. Oh, cool. And, or, or, or lavender, and it all, or different shades in between, and they only get like this big, but oh my gosh, they're just lovely. Gorgeous. Yeah, full range. Fantastic. Um, what about as far as a question coming in on when you're eating jellyfish, is there a particular species that is they, sold? Or, they yeah, do uh, cannonball-like jellies. So they're all tropical jellies yeah. uh, in the family Rhizostoma. Um, but it, they all look like a cannonball, like a cannonball with little nubby things dangling off the the bottom and there are a number of different species that are kind of fit that category but they're all cannonball like stomalopus maligris um stuff like that but cannonball tropical jellies they've got a big huge bell with a lot of mesoglea a lot of gel jelly for them to process you know i could imagine something smaller probably might not be worth their time you could process them but it might not be worth the time it's not a good business decision to do moon jelly. Yeah. There you go. Um, another question uh, as far as the like thinking about the different tanks. I'm going to call you the jellyfish wizard, uh, like the aquarium you developed the magic ball there. Uh, <laughs> what I did, I reinvented the fishbowl. That's what I did. Yeah, a good, a good <laughs> reinvention of the fishbowl there. Very cool. Uh, fun to know you're behind, behind that design. Uh, and then just thinking about um, I guess I've heard that jellies in different aquariums, like, you know, if they bump the side of the tank wrong, like all of a sudden they're like, oh, I'm going to die. I'm very dramatic. Like, is that just for specific species that are vulnerable to kind of like that disturbance? Or are there some I, that are tougher than others? Some are tougher than others. Um, I didn't really get into it, but, you know, to keep jellies happy, it's all about keeping, keeping things clean, well fed, and properly balanced currents flow. So flow balancing is a thing. Nice. But if water is going into a tank and then water is leaving out of the tank, how do you keep the jellies inside the tank when the water leaves? And so right. we have different games with spray bars and screens. And so if a jelly gets close to the outflow screen, the spray bar kind of pushes it. The globe functions completely different from all of that. But there's Water going in and still water going out, but there are no screens or spray bars. All the magic happens at this lid at the top. And I'm happy to show anybody who, not, if you go to PDZA, I haven't hidden anything. It's all, all there. there. <laughs> and then if you want to do your own globe, um, here, here's what I do. Here's what I did. Um, you, you're not going to be able to, well, you could buy a three foot one, but on Amazon, you can get a 24 inch diameter one. Just don't call it a fish tank. For a globe, what you want is a plastic street light cover. Street oh. light. And then you get your hole saw and you just poke holes in the bottom with your hole saw and your bulkhead fittings and then put that on a garden hose or a garden valve box. Now you got a stand for your globe aquarium. <laughs> We're going to be walking around Tacoma and they're just going to be popping up in people's yards all over the place. Uh, I was a <laughs> can't wait. You know, I was born on Fort Lewis. You know, my family didn't have a lot of money and my dad was a drill sergeant. So I had to, if I wanted something, I had to make it. And I kind of kept that going. That's fantastic. Because yeah. I know there's some other little eight year old kid who was like me in Tacoma wandering around. And he's like, man, I want one of those, but I don't have any money either. And I'm like, well, <laughs> no problem, buddy. Let's make this. And that's what we do. Oh, fantastic. Well, uh, one more question. How do we set up an incubator tour with you? Where did you go to this point to find some aquarium situation? You know, that sounds like a fun, I mean, I'd be happy to give your group a, a tour. I just don't know how we set it up, but I bet we could figure that out. All right, folks. You'll have to let me know if that's of interest and we'll see what we can yeah. do. Talk to Sita. Yeah. <laughs> Check with me. I'll talk to Dad. We're yeah. here to make dreams come true. <laughs> uh, well, we've got some thanks coming in. Patty, Margot are both, you know, great presentation. Thank you so much. So interesting. Um, so uh, I think that's, I think all the questions I have for you, I'm really just that fascinating connection between the temperature 
um, and jellies, because I've definitely heard that, yeah, jellies are taking over the world. And when I was hearing about them, you know, if they have the power to shut down a nuclear power plant, I'm like, they are taking over the world. Like, look at them go. But interesting to hear that temperature could be a limiting factor there. But, well, you know, also they're important, so. jellyfish have been around for a really long time. I mean, they outlive the disappearance of the dinosaurs. And, wow. uh, you know, they're going to be around for a long time time so really we need to learn to live with them and you know not try to eradicate them we just need to learn to live, live with them is, is all and they're they're part of the ecosystem they have jobs to do they have roles to play just like all of us so yeah. uh, well, i say cheers to the to the jelly level of the food web i think uh, this has absolutely been fascinating and again we're just so thankful that you could join us and um, happy to have people tuning in from all over the place. Uh, it's fantastic to see so many folks watching and learning and having fun. So um, with that, I think any last thoughts to leave us on before I give just a couple quick announcements? Well, I just say, you know, thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, Chad. Um, so things coming up, looking forward to. If you want to make your way out to Lopez Island, uh, Rachel and I will be doing a low tide beach walk in the San Juans, San Juans on Agate Beach um, on uh, next week, next week's Friday, whatever date that is at nine in the morning. So <laughs> come on over. Uh, otherwise, you could look forward to some low tide beach walks at the very beginning of September. And then we kind of transition into our fall season where we have more cocktails and fishtails presentations. Um, and we'll keep you updated with that Wild Side Weekly newsletter. So if you're not signed up for that, uh, I have a feeling we'll be doing some jellyfish uh, features here in the next couple creature features on that. So uh, super fun to learn about all these cool, cool species and what's going on in the Puget Sound. So uh, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Chad, for presenting. Uh, and with that, I'll go ahead and conclude um, our Facebook Live part, and and just mention again, a lot of a lot of love coming in through the comments. So uh, I think you. you knocked this one out of the park. <laughs> Thank you, Chad. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Bye, everybody. <laughs>